Hello, that was a bop. Uh, I was yeah. jamming. No. jamming out. <laughs> we are here. It's early. We are doing it. Uh, it's not early for Aaron because he's on the West Coast. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Freelancing in Tabletop. Um, if you are passionate about tabletop gaming and want to learn how to freelance uh, within uh, that sphere, You've come to the right place, kid. I don't know what this energy is this morning, but it's like, it's great. <laughs> um, uh, well, today we're going to talk about uh, how to find a niche in freelancing. We're going to talk about how to find those freelance jobs and showcasing your experience. Um, we're going to talk about pay rates and negotiation and uh, freelancing part-time versus full-time, which is a whole thing. Um, and then have some time for Q&A if anyone has any questions. Um, to start off with, we're going to introduce ourselves. Um, I am already talking, so I guess I'll start. Uh, I'm Michelle and Bradley. Hello. I'm moderating and I'm also a panelist because there's only four of us today. <laughs> um, I am a full-time freelancer. I uh, do event production and uh, show producing for actual plays and uh, for marketing assets for gaming. Um, I also do uh, live stream, sorry, what's it called? <laughs> actual play <laughs> acting uh, and playing and uh, DMing, all that good stuff. And have been doing this for about I've been full-time freelancing since about 2009, which is a long time. Uh, and that's me. Uh, let's start with, uh, next, I mean, next, let's have Aaron, please talk about your, your stuff. Hello. Um, my name is Aaron Catano Sayas. Um, I'm a voice actor and podcast person who also has worked in tabletop games, writing, contributing writing. I've done a little bit of designing. I make audiobooks for tabletop games. I'm... I'm just kind of around and I'm willing to do anything for money, which is kind of what this panel is about. Is it? <laughs> for, keeping it for keeping it 100. Yeah. It's like, yeah. hey, how to stay alive and use all your tools for whatever. Yeah, full know? disclosure, it is 2024 and the economy is like not super great. So we will have a little bit of realness in this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Aaron, ah. for ah. that reality check. Um, Banana Chan, how about you? Yeah. Hi, I'm Banana. Uh, my friends are she, they, and he. Uh, I'm the owner and co-founder of a small RPG publishing company called Read Write Memory, previously known as Game and a Curry. Uh, and I used to do a lot of freelancing. I don't do as much freelancing now. Um, I only do it when it's like a friend or someone's just like, hey, want to do a thing and here's a lot of money. And I'm like, okay, sure. Uh, but now I mostly make my own IPs and uh, I also work full time in games. Amazing. Um, I like that you, you're a friend with money. Talk to me in the chat. Thank you. Uh, Xander, how about you, bud? Yeah, hello, I'm Xander Genre. I am an actual play performer, um, but I also am full-time freelance as well in spheres other than tabletop, but mostly there. Um, I also studio manage. It's been a relatively new position over at Pixel Circus. And so I have a little bit of an insider uh, knowledge onto like how to um, create those pitches and things like that too. So I'm happy to, to speak on that because I know there are a lot of people in the audience that are interested in the space. Yeah, so... Um... We have a lot of different backgrounds here today for you. And I feel like uh, when people think about freelancing and gaming and tabletop gaming specifically, it they get they they really hyper focus on like you're just a game designer. And that's not true. You can do anything because freelance uh, because tabletop gaming, like any major business, is a uh, is a multifaceted uh, conglomerate thing to to make to make a game is hard. You need people to design it, people to draw it, people to market it, a place to make it, um, people to work on shipping distribution. There's many, many different things you can do. Um, so with all of these different ways to be involved in gaming, I'd love to talk to, uh, I'd love to have everyone to speak to how they found their niche. Um, so for example, how did you figure out what you were good at in the tabletop industry? So like I said, there's so many things you could have done. Why did you choose your your niches? Like how did you find your, your spark? Whoever wants to go. I can talk a bit about that. Um, for me, I have a degree in acting. Uh, that's what I went to school for. And I was lucky enough, because because I'm ancient, that I was here for like the beginning of when tabletop actual play became like a, a format for, um, especially with Geek and Sundry, I feel like was really a trailblazer at the time too. Doing That was where like Critical Role originated. Uh, and it was really fun to work in that experimental era. Everybody was just trying, like throwing spaghetti at the wall, seeing what worked, what didn't work. And then even the actual play format, finding out like what, what would be like the tent poles for creating actual play content moving forward. And so 
it was fun to be a part of that like creation process and uh it was combining my love for gaming with my acting and this like production stuff that i wanted to be a part of by moving to los angeles so it was a great like entryway into that i think it's a little bit different now um but i will say i encourage people to constantly change the format experiment get out there do other things and that's what i find interesting uh and creative about the process yeah, I think similar to Xander, I think um, I also, I don't have a, a degree in acting, but I do have a degree <laughs> in art. <laughs> right. Wait, um, what? This is a, I'm hearing about this. Like, I know. You're not a performer Aaron, in the right. actual place, man? <laughs> this whole time, I've just been going on to actual plays. I don't know why people invite <laughs> me to things, and I just show up. Um, and, uh, I have uh, a master's in graphic communications and management. And so a lot of that I feel like was just, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Um, <laughs> but I really like being creative. I really like, you know, writing and designing stuff. And so, uh, it wasn't until I started going to conventions where I realized like, oh, actually, like maybe I can make this a thing. And I was making videos for, um a lot of different companies like various different like bully pulpit i did some videos for uh, i think it was breaking games um and then eventually i started designing uh for the golden cobra challenge and from there i felt like the confidence to be like oh okay like maybe i could do this more often maybe i could take up some jobs i start working on kids on bikes um because i was friends with doug Lewandowski at the time and uh john gilmore and they were both just like hey let's do you want to write something? And I was like, sure. Um, and so I wrote dads on mowers as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, Wait, how do we play this game? When I haven't seen that anywhere. <laughs> it's the same. It's just a module. So it's just like a, a scenario, Incredible. Uh, the so same cool. mechanics as kids on bikes, but like yeah. your dads. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think like it snowballed into getting more and more freelance stuff from there. Amazing, Aaron. Uh, uh. So for me, I can say how I figured out like what I'm good at in the space is like by keeping it real and knowing what I'm not good at and what I don't do. Because like I'm a, I was an actor person who like I love tabletop games and video games and nerd stuff. So I always wanted to approach this with a level of like here's what I don't do is like build mechanics. So where can I actually fit in into what places using the skill. I want to do because if you try to fake it, you just it's it, one. If you did work out, it's gonna suck because you're gonna be doing something you don't even know how to, how to do. Or I mean, if that's your thing, you want to like figure it out. That's great. I didn't. Um, I wanted to just like use my creativity in the tabletop space using my voice, my brain, and my love of all things games. So like my contributions to design would you be like i don't know i wrote abilities for a game called perilous and so i wrote like a hundred abilities that you can use the mechanics element was not me and that's what i'm like i being honest is always my thing of like how did you get into this space i'm like being honest about what i do and what i don't do and what i know how to do and what i don't because someone will either call you out or you'll just be miserable <laughs> that, no that's very fair <laughs> no. Because it's always like, you know, you got to be a million different things. Like, you really effing don't. You you can do one thing, like, really well or a couple things yeah. really well. And, like, if, if they – there's always – if I may use a quote, there is a, the, a famous production of a, a company that was on Broadway. Everybody played their own instruments. And Mary Mitchell Campbell, uh, the music director, was asked, like, how did you find these people? And it's like, if we need people who do this – we will find them. Don't fake it. it. We'll just hire someone who can do that. Don't come in playing the trombone if you've never done it before. You know, we'll find someone who plays the trombone. So, you know what I mean? So that's that's back, kind of been my approach to tabletop games. Of like, if they need someone to write mechanics for how to roll dice, they'll find it. But it's not me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's a very good point. Um, we will segue to that very shortly. Um, and I think... Yes, be honest. Um, my background is, I, I kind of did thing you said not to do, which is do everything. Um, because when I was in college, <laughs> I was an overachiever and I, I had a, a triple major in uh, English literature, advertising and Japanese language. So 
those three things really shot my life into like a different trajectory than I think I, when I first started college that I thought I would do. I ended up moving to Japan. Um, I lived there for a couple of years and then I moved to Los Angeles and um, for a Japanese related job and I actually started in Japanese pop culture um, magazine publishing. Um, and yes, I'm in a very different place now in my life, but like everything I've learned from then until now I use in, cause I'm a producer, like anything you I've learned, I, I apply to what I do today. Um, but I didn't do it. I didn't learn everything at once. I hyper-focused and did one thing really good, like Aaron said. And then I, when I was tired of it, basically, cause I probably have ADHD, I don't know. Um, I would just be like, what's the next thing I'm going to learn how to do from scratch. And then I would just do that for like a few years. I worked in, um, I worked in like uh, fabrication for fashion accessories. I worked, I worked in the fashion industry for a couple of years and then I slowly moved over. And then when I got into tabletop, it was sort of like an extension of me doing, I was already doing Twitch streaming content really in the early years, like before people were really doing it, like pre-pandemic, um, like 2016, 2015 era. So when I was doing that, people were like, oh, Michelle, are you interested in tabletop gaming? You're like, yeah, I play, but I didn't know you could stream that, you know, cause it was again, no, this is in the, the just like beginning of the Geek and Sundry days, even though I wasn't heavily involved with that crew. Um, and then as we move forward, you know, um, tabletop gaming became uh, a, a way to produce content, a way to create entertainment, not just a way to enjoy yourself in your own home. Um, and so I follow, sort of followed that trend and that trend is moving, but um, I'm, I'm still involved in that. Um, but enough about me. Um, I think we did sort of cover, I was going to ask you guys, how did you train or gain experience in that field? But I feel we kind of, we sort of, we got there. We, we evolved like Pokemon. We started like a starter Pokemon and now we are our mid-size or big a Blastoise, unclear. Um, <laughs> we've all been doing this for a while. We're all Blastoise little, I think. Is there one up past that? I don't know. Yeah, we have guns. Um, <laughs> we don't have guns. Yeah. Sorry, this is early. Uh, we're gonna talk about job hunting. So I think the biggest question people have usually is like, okay, you decide you're gonna freelance. How do you make money and how do you live your life? Um, so I would love to address the elephant in the room is what advice do you have about finding these freelance jobs in your specific field? Cause that's like a big, it's a big question. Who'd like to start? Anybody, should I pick somebody? Yeah, I can go. So I think yes. the bulk of my freelancing stuff, um, and, and I want to just clarify, like a lot of the freelancing stuff that I used to do was in game design and writing. Um, a lot of that stuff happened uh, pre-pandemic. So I got most of my jobs then. Um, and a lot of that came from networking, going to conventions, meeting different people. And uh, the type of networking that I did specifically was going to conventions that did playtesting. And so like meeting other designers, meeting other writers who, you know, were willing to pass around the same $20 <laughs> to like another <laughs> writer who needed a job. Right. Um, and so it's like that joke that we just like pass the same 20 bucks, like run <laughs> the entire industry. Um, but uh, that's sort of where it started. And I think it picked up a lot. Um, when everyone was like working from home uh, or staying at home during the pandemic, you know, we sort of had to like pivot and find other ways of play testing and find other ways of networking and meeting one another. And so I think for a while that it, it started from G plus and then G plus, you know, shut down. And then uh, it ended up being like Twitter and, you know, all these other places. And so trying to find like other people um, who were looking for people that were making things. Um, that was really important in uh, trying to grow that network. Yes, networking. I would say networking across different kinds of jobs is very different. So you specifically did playtesting. Um, Xander, yeah. talk about your net, or well, sorry, talk about how you find jobs. Yeah, yeah. And it's tough because I get asked a lot, you know, I want to break into performing in the actual play space. And it's it's a tough thing to do. Um, but the biggest advice that I give them is to make your own things as well, because um, not only do you get to like hone your skills, you get to work on something that you really want to work on. Uh, but even if like no one is watching per se, like you're streaming out to maybe 10 people or you just mm -hmm. put it up on your YouTube channel or something like that, you still have that resource then to show others like, hey, this is what I'm capable of or this is what I can do. And creating a presence for yourself in social media using those things sort of reminds people that you exist. It's hard to like, I don't want to advocate for existing on social media so much, but a lot of the times I, in my experience, it's when people are casting things, they're sort of sitting through their Rolodex in their heads of like, 
who have I seen recently that has been either doing something or that I want to work with in the future that I've sort of kept in mind. Uh, and so if you just have stuff that you're putting out, you, you're creating and you're showing what you can do and you're becoming like the forefront of people's minds. <clears throat> I would agree. I would say I like the idea of, I love uh, make it something yourself because mm -hmm. a big thing is uh, getting somebody else a job is always, or like a quick little day gig or like a cute little spot on a podcast is just a great thing to do. If you want to, like, if you want to work with somebody, mm -hmm. ask them like, Hey, do you want to be on my show? And like, I want to hear you talk or I want to see you play a game. Not that like expecting something in return, but it is a good way to kind of express a goodwill and it is an easy way to have that conversation without having that conversation where it's like, come on my show. I clearly love what you do, know what you do, respect you, want you on mine. Maybe we'll work together in the future. And if we don't, that's also OK. Um, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Giving other people opportunities is great. Um, how do you find jobs? Um, oh God, uh, uh, transparent conversations with close friends is always a very good one where it'll be like, you know, banana, Hey, I'm trying to work a little more in design. Do you need anybody? You know, it is like, think like if you wanted to work at a salon, you'd be like, I'll, I'll, I'll sweep hair, man. I, I don't care. I'll, I'll do what I got to do. I'll contribute. I'll, I'll color in the pictures in your book if i have to i want to be a part of your project and not like that desperation is like fun but it's having transparent conversations with people you can trust is uh my would be my advice to like how do you find a job it's like a lot of times you can ask friends but having that courage to reach out is a thing where that 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 awkwardness or that fear of failure or i don't want to look foolish you got to silence that or else, you know, that very brazen person will unfortunately always there will always be a villain in that mind of yours. of like, wow, that person doesn't care at all. And they're working all the time. It's like, yeah, because they don't care at all. And that is a very attractive feature for most industries. Someone who doesn't want it that or like, you know what I mean? Anyway, I hear you. Be I hear you have friends. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, have friends. It, it's step one. Have friends. Kind of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have friends i totally have friends um i will do a different point with that because i feel like uh everyone really hit the nail on the head on you know uh networking in your spaces correctly so you know banana was talking about going to playtesting conventions and then moving around from there um xander was talking about sort of being um you know being present and uh being making sure people know you exist by being on social media and aaron obviously you mentioned like sort of uh we call this lateral networking where you're Ooh. working of um who are maybe maybe on the same level maybe like slightly above you but they're not like it's not like a google ceo that you're like hey hey hell you know you're not like going <laughs> out of your sort of lateral network that you are, are are begging somebody who doesn't care who doesn't doesn't know you at all so um i would love to maybe we'll skip around a little here uh talk about um the importance of networking here as is obviously it's important how do you do it how do you do it like and not be like oh god what should i be doing here um i will do like a brief example um to jump off of you know obviously conventions i think are so important to go to if you want to work freelance um meeting people face to face in this field is so important uh tabletop jobs are they're not as many as they seem to be and the community is quite small um you hear about other people in the industry very frequently even if you don't want to um you hear everyone's drama all that stuff so people getting trusted by meeting someone in person i think is very important this industry even though it is the year 2024 is still a little bit old-fashioned that way people don't want to hire people they don't trust you know um they don't people really don't do blind hires i've noticed in this field they have to already know about you have heard about you yes you can apply for a job you see on you know a linkedin but um if they haven't heard about you or you don't have a connection to that company it's very unlikely you're going to get seen at all or even talked to um so i would suggest yeah go to physical conventions i know oh, it's so hard to go outside but you got to do it um you have to be like the inner side seen in spaces um one way or another and I mean that in a, only a positive way, please. Um, and I, I would add on to Aaron's thing that if you are having these honest conversations as well, do them privately. Um, <laughs> I, sometimes people do these things where they like make a big show on like a Twitter, and it's I, I, 
as as like an elder millennial, I want to tell you that's not the, the, it, it'll get you clicks, but it's that ain't it. The, the employers see that and they're like, Jesus Christ, like what if I don't want to bring this person on my team because they're gonna bring people don't want to bring drama to their company. They want to bring good work ethic and creative people and people who do good work. Um, they don't want someone who's gonna create a scene unless. You're an actor. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, but like speaking off of that too, there is like you have to keep a sort of level of professionalism. It's always a balance because you want authenticity, especially if it's like your personal social media that like this is just me expressing my thoughts and I've gained a following because of that. It's hard to shift and to change because people will like maybe even call you out of like, oh, you used to be real, but now you're just like corporate shilling sort of thing. But there, once you get like a platform, there is a sort of responsibility that if you want to work with larger brands, they're going to be looking at that sort of thing. And I know a lot of people are like, well, they won't look at my personal Twitter. They will. They see it all <laughs> because people are hyper aware at these brands now because bad PR on one member of a team can send a whole project down the drain. But yeah, it's it's a tough balance to try to find to be like authentic on social media and share the struggles that you're going through because a lot of people do. Um, but again, what like you mentioned, reaching out in private is probably the best way to do that. Yeah. Go ahead. Are you gonna, oh, sorry, I thought someone was gonna say something. Um, I, I kind of do. I kind of do. I yeah, kind of do because I'm all about like the the shoot your shot concept. You know that's on social media. The shoot your shot. Ask you know the 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 well for lack of using famous people, the Google CEO to have a meeting with you. But that level of like you know just ask him to be on your podcast. It's like yes. However, if you actually want to get like results or like a, a also adjust your time like your, what is your time horizon for this. You know, because you can whittle away at like a famous person, we'll call them online, or you can like ask mm -hmm. friends who are in gigs who have things like, you know, start small and build your way up. You don't have to shoot your shot at the moon. You can start with like, you know, the, the, the different spheres above the earth and eventually get to the moon, you know, <laughs> start small, Absolutely. work your way up, like adjusting your time horizon for like what this is going to look like. If you want to like be a freelancer and I want to make money on the internet, adjust your time horizon because odds are it's, it's a, uh, it might take a little while. You might be, I don't know, whatever, Jojo Siwa or something and make a million dollars in like a couple of years. But I don't know who's popular anymore. Um, but adjust your time horizon. <laughs> Jojo jo jo Siwa. <laughs> you know, Jojo Siwa. Leave her alone. <laughs> that cool new kid is on the scene. But adjust your time horizon. It's like, you know, I knew from acting land that like, it's just going to take a while, but uh, it, it's very similar in this field as well, both from oversaturation and, you know, unless you're already famous from something else, mm. it's going to take a while and that's fine. Just adjust your expectations and enjoy the, it really is like, it's the, about the journey kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. I think, oh, sorry, Michelle, what were you going to say to me? No, 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 please go ahead. I was just um, <laughs> What you were talking about reminded me of a few things. So um, going back to the original prompt of like, how do you network? I think uh, the first thing I want to talk about is play. So we mentioned like play testing, right? We mentioned like talking, uh, meeting people at conventions. I think that, you know, a lot of my networking came from just like playing private games that are not publicized with other people who were designers or writers or, you know, people who just like you know we're just excited for games whatever um and i think that because you're playing in that private space you're able to see what those people are like when they're in play and you immediately build connections that way you build rapport because they're acting in a way where it's like oh okay like you know this is not publicized this is not performance i'm playing as you know a character that i want to be and so that's sort of how you can build relationships that way. Like if you wanted to network, like we're in a very unique situation in this industry because other industries, they don't get a chance to do that. They don't get a chance to meet other people for who they are when they're in play. But here we get a chance to do that. You could be sitting next to like the, I don't know, the CEO of a big company and playing a game with them, right? Um, which leads me to my next thing, which is know who you're talking to and how to talk to them. 
each individual is going to have a different approach. And so, for example, if you are looking for a writing gig, it's less likely that an actor will give you a writing gig versus, you know, uh, like a, a publisher from yeah. a company who is looking for writers, um, you know, it's more likely that they'll be able to give you that writing gig. And so I think trying to uh, manage your message towards different people and trying to figure out like who in the industry to go to is really important. If yes. I could piggyback off of that Please. too, uh, a general rule of thumb though too, and I think a lot of people forget this, is just try to be nice to everybody yeah. because you these companies, especially in this industry, are so volatile. So we talk about like your dream gigs, but those companies can crumble in an instant. And so those people then are spread out all along and suddenly like the PA that you treated like crap is a producer at some somewhere else because they've leveled up their game you know just be nice to everybody and and uh everybody has something to contribute as well but again like banana was saying targeting your message and asking the right questions because you know sort of their field and what they're in i have a quick Aaron. thing i have a quick thing and it's about the the networking conversation and being nice um beware of making every interaction with networking hashtag content because that is a big red flag when mm -hmm. someone is like hey we should play a game together and you're like oh heck yeah like a private game at a con like i said no i'm gonna get the cameras i'm gonna tweet about it and you're like okay i see what this is you know it just becomes enjoy just building genuine relationships with human beings and not making it hashtag content because you just come off as kind of snaky and wormy and no one likes that unless they're um, unless they're trying to build their like catalog of people to secretly loathe you know because that's a quick way to get on that <laughs> but I mean, if you're not trying to do that yeah but it's just that idea of like i get it the necessary the, the necessity to constantly like be making things and that chest crushing pressure However, learn how to go, whew, this is for fun, this, or this is, I just kind of want to talk to this person and hang out. It doesn't have to, I don't have to tweet afterward. We don't have to snag a selfie and put it on the Instagram. We can just hang out and enjoy this, and then maybe I'll ping them later. But for yeah. now, I'm going to enjoy a human talk. I think that's so real. Um, I, it like, hurt me a little bit because I, I, I think... <laughs> We've all been in this industry for a while. Like we're a little bit elder, I would say. Like we we're, we're, not, we're not just running out of freelance. Nice We've all been doing this for a while. Shush. And um, I think sometimes people approach me looking for work, but they don't know what I can offer them. They like it's clear. From, people are always like, they, they just say things to me that they clearly don't know even, even really know what I do, mm -hmm. or they want to make content with me. I don't think it's very rare that someone approaches me and tries to have a normal non-work. Like, how do I say this? People don't want to be my friend. They want a job. That's fine. I get it, guys. Okay, I, I understand that, especially if I'm when you a networking event. I get it. That's what we're here to do. But I feel like I, when someone does approach me and it's like they, they, oh, I love your work. That's fine. But then they, they, you know, then they're just having like, oh my god, yeah, the traffic was crazy getting here. Like having those sort of like about the weather conversations. I'm kind of like, oh yeah, good. You're normal. Like we're not gonna, you're not gonna just like, you know, ping me with all like like question after question after question about like the industry. And I know it's important. I know it's again, people are hungry and it's it's. The economy is not great, but I think like Aaron said, like, let's connect like normal human beings first. And then like, maybe I'll feel like helping you. It sounds messed up, but it's, I think I don't really have these, you know, like having coffee with someone. Amazing. Love it. Uh, Lo like, let's get away from where we are and let's have coffee. I do that so rarely, but I wish it would happen more. I wish people would ask me. I ask all the time other people, but I feel like people don't ask me. <laughs> and maybe that's a me thing. I don't know. But I think people, it would help people to realize that we should go, we should be a little old fashioned sometimes. It helps. Um, I would love to, if you even do this, do you, do any of you use certain websites to look for jobs or is it always just about networking for you guys primarily? Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. It's okay. Uh, I think the, the industry is changing and has changed from early on because I used to use something like Actors Access or- Oh, you, man. Sorry. Yeah, or like, <laughs> <laughs> like casting or something like that. Uh, Voices 123, I'm sure you have a lot of experience with that too. Um, so there used to be, but now it's different because there it's it's all like paid services that you, you can't access these things unless you pay a certain amount. LinkedIn has become this different beast all together it's just another social media site now but i know a lot of people have returned to it for for job searching 
Yeah, I was gonna say LinkedIn as well. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> um, like I think that so I found uh, my full time job through LinkedIn, um, and that's been really helpful. Uh, I think that there's also this Facebook group, um, and probably there's like multiple of them where they are dedicated towards building like a database of job openings and job postings. So like you know, say for example, I don't know, Cephal Affair is looking for a contract writer, they'll immediately post it onto that Facebook group. Huh. Uh, I think it's called Tabletop Jobs or something like that. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's run by Ross Thompson. And I would really recommend people oh, use that. Tabletop Jobs. Thing, I think it's, yeah, I think it's called, just look for Tabletop Jobs on the one Facebook and it'll come up first thing. Okay. I have never used a Incredible, kind of yes. <laughs> yeah, I've never used a website like that before. <laughs> Um, uh, I kind of was just, I used social media yeah. a lot and just like, you know, in, in the networking way of like, you know, asking friends or, I mean, in the earlier days of my internet existence, like 2016, 17, I'd be like, anybody need a voice, you know, anybody need anything? We can't do that anymore. But I would say being just, uh, having a good website and having resources where people can find you yeah. are, are also incredibly valuable. Um, because if banana is like, Hey, Xander, I need somebody who does X, Y, and Z. Oh, Aaron, is that mm -hmm. use, you know, and then sends all my stuff. That mm -hmm. has been my thing, but the websites, it depends on what you're doing. Like, you know, the tabletop kind of gigs and stuff have never been my bread and butter. Cause it terrifies me, but, <laughs> uh, uh, mine's been more of a networking and existing on Twitter and having easy access to the things that I do and resources and links have always been, what has been beneficial for me. Yeah, I would love to move the conversation over to how do you show your work or do you need to with your field? Um, so for me personally, I do so many things. I just have a full website with like sort of tabs for my different kinds of jobs that I do, like producing, fabrication, um, you know, uh, event planning. Like I have little tabs and then I have um, photos um, or video if I have them from those events. Um, michellewinbradley.com, check it out. Um, and it's really important for me to have this, not because people are actively going there, like, wow, who is this girl? It's when I'm looking for jobs and I'm trying to interface with someone new, they need to see proof of concept of Michelle. Who the hell is this person? If they already know me, right? If we're not laterally networking, if this is just a new person who got, I got referred to, it's really great to have your body of work available for someone to look for. Um, <clears throat> as somebody who hires people also, when I find people don't have a website or don't have anything on their profile or a link for me to go to, I'm just like, okay, I guess I'm digging through your Twitter. And that's a really crappy way for me to get to know somebody. But sometimes that is what you, you do like a pre, a pre research on somebody before you actually go to talk to them. Um, it's like betting. Um, and then you start trying to figure out, okay, who are they friends with and doing that without there being a website to tell me this is who I am. Um, I think having that voice, even when you don't even know your speaking to someone you don't know <laughs> is really important um, for, I think any industry, honestly, I think whatever industry you're in, I think it's good to have a little, a little about you on a place that is your own, that is not a Twitter, but that's just me. How do you, how do you all feel about that? Yeah. It's like the, like a modern day business card sort of thing. People want that sort of easy access to just the quick highlights so that what, like what we talked about before, you know who you're talking to and you know what they can do and the things that they're proud of. Um, also for, if you have something like for me, I have a hard to spell last name. Um, but if people are Googling me, a lot of the times the website will show up if it's like your name.com or your name with, uh, you know, associated with things. Yeah, I think definitely using, um, like I have a website, uh, for my company. I also have a website for myself um pinning like you know all the stuff that i do at the top of like the social media pages um just in case anyone's just like oh you post a lot of pictures with these board games like did you make them or do you just like them right because there are like board game content creators out there as well so making sure that you know folks know exactly what you do uh and just like having them at the very top making them accessible uh that's been really helpful yeah, you want to have a place for people to find your work before you start asking for it. You want to have that all taken care of ahead of time, like a nice, pretty website. It can be free. Like, nobody cares if it's like Aaron at Wix.com. Nobody gives a shit right, about right. that. Um, but just have a place that is delicious and easy. Like, I don't need to read about your life with your grandma. I really <laughs> just want to see what you do. 
and like i do this 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 and this here it is you know there's nothing wrong with having a one page website just as long as it's a sexy delicious place for me to learn what it is what you do because i just want to know even if i'm just being nosy uh, and it just for me it, it shows a level of professionalism that you go oh, okay well i know that they know their stuff they know i know that they're not like you know uh 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 not in the industry, you, like no letting people know that you're of this, you're about this life is like half the battle because a lot of people say they are, but aren't, but it's like, all right, having a website, having a delicious place to find your things, having places to contact you, not having an embarrassing mix of social media presences. It, it and that's, it, it's important to have all these dots crossed before you start looking and asking people for money. You know, it's a big deal. Yeah, um, I love delicious. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> I would Google what a one sheet is. Try to make that for yourself, mm. like a bullet point list of like what you do, why you good, you know, that kind of thing. Where you are, your goddamn email address. Sorry, I swear. Um, <laughs> please put your email address somewhere in your social media. All I don't, I don't make it make a dummy one if you don't want to give someone your personal one. That's like your like just make an email address for the love of God. I have been trying to hire people like my entire life, you know, when, I, when I'm trying, like, oh, this person will be greatest thing. How do I talk to them? Oh God, I've got to DM them on Twitter and they don't even look their DMs. Just put your email address on and please check your email. That's just me begging you as a producer and please reply to the emails for the love of God. Um, that, I want to go piggyback ahead. off. That's actually a genuine tip that I had received early on and has been really helpful is if you are prompt with answering emails, people remember that. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's like a genuine, uh, uh, like a mark in your favor. So yeah. it's really, really something to keep in the forefront of your mind, uh, just to keep in constant communication with people. Yeah. If you're not an email person, it doesn't matter. You become, if you're a freelancer, you become an email person. Yeah. You just have to. It is professionalism. It is making someone not wait on you. And you can lose jobs if you, yes. you know, when people do a soft reach out, they're usually reaching out to a bunch of people at the same time. So if they don't hear from you in like that day you lost it already like that's just that's unfortunately the name of the game um okay let's we have a ton of time left um i would love to talk about um money really quick how do you charge money how does this work um this is a big big conversation but people always ask me how do you know what to charge um if and if you don't want like, i would love you all to speak to how you do that research to figure mm -hmm. it out how do you mine is really short i i look up other people that are doing it and i look up what they charge and then i go I bet I could do better than that or like what they do <laughs> or I'm like, well, I can't handle that. And so, you know, I, I judge accordingly based on like, you know, I just make like a comfortable media, like where I might fit into what the, the median might be, you know, what are people charging? Where do I fit in? And I get a little judgmental and sassy and I start getting confident because 80% of it is just getting the confidence up to ask for a certain number, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So finding out what other people are charging and then uh, building a strategy accordingly has been my go-to because I don't know anything. I'm just a theater person. <laughs> <laughs> theater people make things happen, baby. Woo! <laughs> but yeah, I, I would say w one of the things that I have right now is a rate sheet, and that really helps me out in just like – um, in naming my price for someone. So if I say, oh, I'm going to have this social media post, this costs this much, a full actual play that I'm producing would cost this much X, Y, Z. Um, you don't want to give companies too many options because a lot of the time it's like a, a marketing person that just wants the solution. They don't want to have to choose. So again, this goes into your research, but real inside baseball. Sometimes I find a company that I want to work with, see what their upcoming release schedule is, and then what kind of content I would be excited about making for that content. Uh, and that way you can just pitch, hey, I see you have this board game coming out. I really love it. I could do a shout out here, a TikTok there, you know, something on my live stream, or I could produce this full thing. Here are my rates. Yeah, I think speaking from the publisher side, um, I don't do, uh, like I said, like I don't do a lot of freelancing anymore, but when I used to freelance, uh, it would be 10 cents a word, right? Um, and that was like, uh, I guess like 2019, 2020, 2021 one ish yeah so around that time like a lot of the work that i did was always like 10 cents a word or you know if the publisher was like a larger publisher aim for like um you know 15 cents a word but um there are publishers out there who were also willing to give like 25 cents a word 
Um, but the caveat I do want to put out there is that there are publishers who bring in a lot more money. And then there are very small indie publishers who cannot afford that rate. And so um, it's a matter of like trying to figure out like who exactly this publisher is and like how much are they able to, um, you know, able to give uh, their, their freelancers. And I think outside of um, writing and designing and all of that, um, there's also like hourly rates. So some, you know, graphic designers, they charge, uh, you know, an hourly rate. Uh, illustrators, they all do the same thing. Um, and I think for publishers, uh, it's good practice for illustrators specifically to do 50-50, so, or even 10-40-50. Um, so it's like, you know, you pay 10, uh, percent upon signing, 40% like halfway through the work, and then the rest once it's done. So that's like, you know, good practice for publishers to do that for illustrators. Now, there are other jobs out there that don't, you know, require that. Um, and, you know, that could just be a matter of like, okay, once you're done, then here's like your, um, you know, here's your pay. Uh, but sometimes if it's like a larger job, uh, it might be a matter of here's half, you know, upon signing, or here's 20% upon signing, and then you know the rest you get later. So it's all dependent on what the job is and yeah. who you're talking mm. to. I mean, and I feel like you keep saying you don't freelance anymore, but I feel like it's untrue because you still, you said you are creating your own IP still. So that's, you're basically freelancing for yourself. Like that job mm -hmm. is not part of your full-time job. So you, you still freelance. <laughs> um, and I guess um, we are kind of hitting the Q&A portion and we were gonna talk about this anyway. Um, so I would love to talk about sort of balancing uh, are you, well, first of all, are you a full-time freelancer? Because someone asked that. Um, and if you're doing it part-time, how do you balance it? Um, I, I do want to start with this a little bit. Just I am a full-time freelancer, but twice in my life, I've gone back to full-time with freelancing um, on the side because I just didn't have enough money. The, the industry was not supporting me enough and I just needed more money. Um, for me, I'm always very carefully calculating my savings versus my daily income my monthly income, like what what are my expenses? And if I hit a, if I hit below a certain amount of money, I'm like, it's time for a full-time job. And I think there's no, it's okay to go mm -hmm. back and forth. That's just me though. Some people are like, no, only full-time or oh no, only part-time freelance. Um, that's my personal thing. Go ahead, take it, take it away, kids. Yeah, I think the biggest thing with that that I have found is to diversify your sources of income. So I do freelance free or freelance full time, but I have different things that I'm doing outside of the industry as well. Like I manage buildings or I'm managing the studio or I've worked as a translator for for Japanese before. So uh, like find, using your skills in different ways to sort of supplement where your income is and even something like, for me, I have a personal Twitch channel. It's not a huge income generator, but it's part of it. You know, even just having these small pro uh, projects that are for yourself that you sort of, eventually it all sort of adds up, hopefully. <laughs> but the other big thing is that it comes in waves. You know, a lot of the time you're riding through this freelancing life and you, you're making a lot, but then you have to save it for when there's a dip in income as well. And it's just riding that up and down and it's terrifying. Um, am I a full freelance, a full time freelancer? Hell no! Hey, hell no! Um, <laughs> I have a literal catering shift in four hours. That's still two a.m. I'll keep it real. Um, I'm gonna literally be on Paramount Plus on Nick Jr. show on Saturday. But I don't, that that don't keep me alive. <laughs> like so, just keeping it real with you, kids. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, kids, I'm talking to you. Learn how to make money and from lots of different streams of revenue. Don't expect your creative thing to pay the every, like it's the gambler's fallacy of like you always hear about the guy who walks out of the casino with a hundred million dollars, not but not the ten million dollars he's lost. And so it's like remembering that kind of thing of like, yeah, that you might don't base yourself on the people at the top. Start learning your own time horizons and your own understanding of money because odds are be, being full-time freelance that's hard you need a lot of money in 2024 in terms of income to do that so like adjust your expectations and adjust your time horizon <laughs> <laughs> i don't even know how to follow that up no i'm not a full-time freelancer um i hire freelancers uh and i think yeah uh i have a day job and i also have my publishing company um, I try to, uh, I know it might sound like it's unbalanced, but to me, it's pretty balanced where I go to my, you know, my day job and then come home and do the stuff that I love, which is like, you know, writing game design, you know, uh, working with freelancers. And so, uh, 
yeah, just like trying to carve out time, trying to like, you know, add that to your calendar. Uh, Cause if you really do care about it, if you really do care about the thing that you're doing, then I mean, for me, sorry, this is like speaking on behalf of me now. If I really care about the thing that I'm doing, then I will carve out time in order to do the thing. Um, and so whether that means like working on weekends, working, you know, after uh, my day job, then yes, I will do whatever it takes to make sure that my IP or my publishing company or whatever it is uh, that I really care about is successful in the way that I want it to be successful. So that's how I manage my time. But uh, when it comes to freelancers, uh, I try to hire freelancers, ha try to hire my friends um, mm -hmm. and try to make sure that they get paid well. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, Banana, you touched on a really important point we haven't really talked about is like, oh, by the way, it's like, ask yourself, why are you doing this? Hi, why are you doing this? Um, if you want to make games, if you want to be on camera, all anything, try to dig down and do a little soul searching and ask yourself why you're doing this because unfortunately we live in a capitalist society and we have to make money to live or we'll die so if you want this thing it can't really be unfortunately in a creative aspect you can't like want it for the money you have to want it because you want you, you want to be making things and putting it into the world and affecting people's lives as just maybe this is esoteric but because if you don't have that feeling in your heart um it will crush you because you'll be like, why am I working so hard and making zero money? Cause you, mm -hmm. when you start out, that's what's going to be happening. Um, Cause you have to bite and claw your way to make start, you know, to build your career, like any other career. Um, and in tabletop, there's a lot less money to go around. I would say like compared mm -hmm. to like video games or like email marketing or whatever, you know, yeah. um, there's just less money to go around. So you have to really, you know, know why you're doing this, want it and, and be okay with, um, doing all the things we mentioned supplement your income have a time job carve out the time all that stuff um we have very little time let's answer this quickly i guess um someone asked what conventions should a new freelancer network at if on a budget big my bag, answer is the on. one by your house what was that yeah the local said, yeah big bag local, local and big bag up <laughs> yeah. i i would definitely say like local cons and also um if you're in the New Jersey area, double exposure conventions. If you're in the Boston area, I forgot the name of the convention, but there is a convention in the Boston <laughs> area that's for uh, designers and like playtesting stuff. So yeah. And even, uh, I know Gen Con can be hard to get to on a budget, but even if you can just sort of like swing one day or something like that and meet, make an appearance or even on the exterior, like the outside of it, it might be worth it. Yeah, um, basically become big locally, get big globally. I've heard this phrase a lot, and, but yeah, it's yeah, work, work locally as we can. Um, and then the last question uh, was, um, how do you keep a social media presence personal, like a Facebook page since having a social media presence is needed? Uh, my hot take, Facebook, lock it down, just lock it down, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, everything you say is public. If you wanna say something personal, don't treat your social media like your diary, treat it like your content. And that's what I've had to learn. And it's mm -hmm. it didn't use, always used to be like that. Um, but if you don't care, I don't know. Just do you. That's my advice. Anyone else, please. Uh, have you... multiple accounts. Have a private account <laughs> that's for you to vent and scream on Twitter and whine and complain and yell. And then don't. Have one that's your public self and one that's your private self. And I found if I need to vent, texting is a great option. If you have friends that you're close with, especially like a group chat or something like that, just or going out for coffee, like Michelle said, like uh, now you have something to talk about as opposed mm -hmm. to putting it out on a social post. I think I read that question a little bit differently, which was oh, yeah. like, how do you make sure your presence on social media is like personal to, so that. Oh other... yeah. That, oh, that's I see. Right. Okay. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Maybe that needs clarification, but I was thinking like, I, so honestly, I just post whenever I feel like it. So oh, yeah, know. yeah, yeah. At it posting. <laughs> but there's, a, take... it changes okay. it, like all yeah. the time. There, there's like recommended times to post, uh, optimal engagement, stuff like that. You can play that game if you want to, but really curate it for yourself. Yeah. Um, the social media is a monster and it is a game we have to play, but don't let it kill you. Take a break. I'm basically yeah. like not on Twitter unless I'm promoting like this or something specific. Yeah. I just don't, I hate it. Um, do yeah, you? Maybe pick a few. Take, don't do take all care of, them. of your heart. We are basically out of time. So I'd love for everyone to go around and uh, please say where people can find you or what you're working on or, or both, whatever you want. Uh, Aaron, go first, please. Hi, I'm Aaron Catano Saez. You can find me on Twitter at Aaron Catano Saez. Um, watch uh, the new reboot of Dora the Explorer on Saturday because I'll be Woo! in an episode as a singing bunny rabbit in a boy band. Um, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, find me on Twitter and that's about it. <laughs> Thank you, Xander. 
Yeah, you can find me everywhere at Xanderific with two R's and one F. I stream weekly on Twitch with my community. And on Wednesdays, I have a co-working stream uh, where we do writing sprints. So if you want to, you can come and hang out with us. We brainstorm for a bit and then do some sprints to get some, some work done. Uh, otherwise, you can catch me often over on the Pixel Circus channel. I just recently ran um, a game for Hit Point Press with Floral Dragons. So definitely check that out. I love awesome, and banana. <laughs> I'm just, I just wanted to throw that out there. Hi, I'm mm -hmm. Banana. Uh, you can find me all over the internet at Banana Chan Games. Uh, I recently wrote for, uh, or I designed for uh, Van Riders, Van, sorry, Revenant Society for Van Rider Games. So if you want, you can check that out. It's finally out, I think. Um, starting next week, I think uh, all the backers are getting their copies. Uh, mm -hmm. So I designed that with Sun Foam Lim. Uh, it's a PPTA game, time loop. 1920s Paris, uh, 1910s New York, very fun. Uh, you're playing Revenant and you're coming back to life and weird stuff happens. You have to solve your own murder or death or whatever. Uh, Chucky board game is also out. Uh, wait, is it this way? No, it's this way, that way. I don't uh, know. Is that way? Yeah. Uh, Chucky yeah. Board game is also out, so check that out. Uh, and I also have The Darkness at the Brink of Ohio that is coming out to Kickstarter soon in May. Uh, Aaron actually voices the main character in that. So uh, check that out. And so started. make friends. Awesome. Yeah. Make, yes, make friends <laughs> with us. Um, thank you, everyone. You can find me, everyone on the internet 